starts with what we do. It's the primary thing I'm thinking about when I'm designing a lesson. Is it going to be open enough that, no matter what the lesson is, is it open enough that everybody can participate? Is it inviting enough that everybody would want to participate? Because some of the stuff is not so inviting. Is it inviting enough that everybody would want to participate? Is it going to be worth their while doing it? Because if it is, that gives me the opportunity to move around and have those quick one-on-one -on -one conferences, those quick pieces. Deb talked about it, the feedback that you get during the learning that keeps your learning moving forward. That's the biggest thing that I'm thinking about when I'm planning, is how is what I'm going to do, doing right now, going to allow me to get so that I can get in and touch base with those kids. Because for every case study student that Sharon studied and examined and went back to again and again and again, there were others in the classroom. Okay? There always are others in the classroom. And we teach the kids we get. It doesn't matter who they are. And as Deb talked about with her growth mindset, we believe that we can teach all those kids. And we believe that we know enough collectively to make a difference for all those kids. And so that's the piece we're thinking about all the time as we look at the one-on-one -on -one support. Um, and I, you have to keep saying that. Well, you don't. If you agree with me, you have to keep saying that. Um, when you leave this room, because if, if the message that goes out, and you know how sometimes things make perfect sense when you're together, and then somebody else reads a slide three weeks later with no context and thinks, oh my gosh, I knew, I knew we couldn't do it without more support. Okay? I don't think that's what they're saying. What they're saying is, we have to arm ourselves to get with the people we've got. More support would be wonderful, but we have to arm ourselves with the people we've got to get as much support to the individuals in our classroom as possible. And it can't all be whole, whole group, and it can't all be small group. We need the individual side-by-side -side conferences. Then those, that little checking in all the time, that's a piece that makes a difference. The second one that she talked about, feeling safe and supported. Oh my gosh, like isn't that just such common sense? When did we ever walk into our schools, much less our classes, where we didn't want to work in an environment where we felt safe and supportive? And isn't it fabulous that that showed up in the results, that that deep caring of teachers was so evident? that even if the child wasn't making progress, even if the child, and you know what that means, is that not necessarily making project, progress probably means still with, you know, the behavior may not be fabulous, so that you know every day they're never away from school, um, and that, you know, they're, they're always there, and you're still feeling needy, and you're still feeling guilty, and you're still trying hard, um, but the caring never stopped. You know? That's huge, and so we really have to make sure that that message um, goes out and continues. But here's the other piece that I think about in terms of caring, and I remember years ago um, at an inner city schools conference, years and years ago, because Gabby was a baby, and I was tired, so <laughs> I really remember that. And I remember doing a keynote, and I wasn't doing many keynotes at that time because I was way younger, um, and there were other people who were doing keynotes. And I was doing a keynote at the... Um, at, it, somewhere in the Vancouver downtown east side at this um, inner city schools conference with zillions of people there it seemed to me and somebody important stood up and did an intro before I started and talked about the most important thing we do in schools is caring and if we do nothing but care that that's enough especially for kids in the inner city and I thought oh my gosh isn't that terrible because my whole keynote is about how we can't stop at the caring <laughs> <laughs> So then that made it worse. I was tired, there was a baby at home, this important person had just said something that was all completely opposite to what I was going to say. But, and that didn't come out in the results. It wasn't about just caring, but it's also important that we talk about that when we leave this room. Caring is first and foremost, and then comes a commitment to action. Because just loving the kids isn't sufficient. We've got to love them and move them forward. We've got to believe that we can do something that'll make a bigger difference. Choice, of course, of course, of course. Okay. But again, the piece comes back to how do we organize so that there's room for those kids' voices in the classroom? For all those kids, and that's one of those questions I think that, that, that pummels us forward as we keep thinking about, so what would it look like? And I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the fact that we can do choice in a whole group lesson. Okay. 
Okay. Um, and you know, I thought it was really interesting that one of the pieces that the research showed is that one of the things about choice is that there was a hint of, is there more choice in how we start sometimes and less choice in how we show our learning? Okay. And so you know, that makes me think about, so what would that look like if we added in a little more choice? I, I just, this piece just rang in my ear too. Okay? All students are receiving systematic instruction related to decoding. Everybody reported on that. Okay? Um, and Sharon said, and so we know this part is working. Right? Everybody's reporting on it, um, and, and maybe they're not reporting on the meaning piece so much because they think that, that the decoding piece is the piece that we want to hear about. But you know the first part that goes off in my brain is everybody's reporting on it. Did everybody need it? Because okay. I don't know. It just seems to me if I were five years old or six years old or seven years old and reading was pretty complex, and messy and I didn't feel really good about doing this stuff and if I thought that what it was was decoding I don't know that I'd get very excited because mm -hmm. unless it's about meaning you know she Sharon did say you know you know I don't have to talk about meaning because Faye will rant on about it if it's not about meaning who cares okay there is not a soul in this room I would predict that didn't at some point during the summer read something that you had to reread or spend some time on because when you were reading along searching for meaning something came up that got you a bit derailed and so you pulled out some of your strategies if you cared and you tried to make it make sense but you might not have cared and you might have just kept on going and you're still all alive and well and competent <laughs> and here today okay um, and we know you're successful because sometimes, and there's lots of research on this, we treat readers who are successful differently than we treat readers who are less successful. And so when I saw that, the thing that I wondered and I worried about is, is that where we're focusing first? And if so, how are we ever going to move kids to be more successful if we're not starting with the joy? If we're not starting with the piece that says, this is something you want to do. We all want to do this. This is part of our learning journey. And we, there are things we know and there's things we don't know and there are things we're going to get better at in here. But we've all got something in here. And it's first and foremost about the engagement piece. It's first and foremost about making sense. It's first and foremost about wanting to do this. It's first and foremost about finding joy. Because if there's not, there's again, if we go to us as a group and we're all kind of committed, like it's still August and we're all here um, and most of you are looking, you know, kind of happy and interacting <laughs> with others and, you know, going on. So it's kind of a specialized group. But why can't these kids be in that same group if we expect that what we're doing is going to be something that they want to participate in. Okay? We can call that play-based, we can call that invitational, we can call that differentiation, we can call it anything we want, but why the question, you know, this is one of those old questions, you know, Donna's she's been ranting about this too, that, that some of us who've been doing this for a long time are thinking about is that why is it that it's suddenly become so onerous? What happened to grab a book, flip through the pages, see if it looks good? Who cares at first if you know the words? Go for gist. Go for looking at the pictures. Tell your friends about some of the stuff that's there because then you'll care enough to want to know more about those words and you'll care enough to want to figure out how you use the strategies to make those words make sense. Because if we start with the bits first, I don't know that we get to the good stuff afterwards because I think it's too hard to get through those bits. Um, if they're not fitting into something that's holistic and fun and has an end. It's all about a goal. Deb talked about the goal. Our goal is to create readers who can read and who choose to read. And I don't know that we're going to get that unless we start, we keep that in mind all the time. Can read, choose to read, want to read, find joy in reading, find purpose in reading. You know, we, we have to keep that first and foremost and up there in the front of our heads. The other piece, I guess, it's about the choosing, is that when we're thinking about the engagement, and we're thinking about choice, and we're thinking about purposes, and we're thinking about why would you want to, um, and it shouldn't have to be a condition until you, you know, 
can read fluently. When I was really, really young and starting to teach, I remembered that there was a time when if you didn't have a certain number of words, you couldn't get a book. Okay? That was a long time ago. Okay? Half of you were not only not born, weren't even thought of. But we don't want to be going anywhere near that again. That you've got to have these pieces done. You have to know these letters. You know, the first day you walk in, why can't you have a book? Why doesn't everybody have a book? We don't. I read lots of things that I didn't understand. Didn't read the whole thing, but I just read little bits and pieces. Um, and sometimes I thought, ooh, wait, no way. Not coming back to that. I'll have to talk to somebody else who can translate that. Some of us, there were a group of us in this room that got an insurance form, and the emails went back and forth around them, and people saying, did any of it make sense to you? No, I read the words, but I didn't get it. Didn't make sense to me either. Okay, let's all quit, and somebody else can <laughs> translate it. No, it's all that same piece. But because the engagement is, you know, the, that's where the engagement is there. But it's, it, it's, the piece that I keep thinking about is choice, choice, choice. And having a just right book in your hands isn't always the most important thing. It is important some of the time, every day. You need to be reading something, remember Allington's talked to us about it, that you can read with accuracy and fluency so that you can get better at that piece. But you also need to be reading something that you'd like to read. And how many, I bet you can all picture what your classroom looks like when you've got kids lying all over the floor and they've got books in their hands and they're talking. You can't get them to be quiet because reading's never quiet in grade one and grade two. And they're talking to each other about what they're reading and they're in depth on those pictures and they're maybe trying to find a word that matches up to those pictures and they're sh taking that book over to share with somebody else. That's reading. That's what reading behavior is about. And we absolutely have to make sure we keep that in mind. And yes, we need the decoding. And yes, we need those pieces. But they're there to support that behavior that says, come and see what I found out. That's the piece that's in our mind all the time. Okay. A managed rant. Say something to the person beside you, please. And then I'll give you learning intentions for what we're going to do this afternoon. Okay. Here are the things we're thinking about. The first is, I'm hoping in the next hour that you're reminded of some practices that you engaged in last year that really made a difference in creating readers in your school. Okay? Some of the things that you did. So you're starting off the beginning of the year thinking, these are the things that I'm going to the wall for. I'm not letting go of them. I know they made a difference. Okay? What, are the, what were some of the things that you did that are supported by research as making a difference? The second one is I want you to be thinking about the mental model of reading. Okay? One of the things that worries me, and you've heard me say this before, is whether or not we carry within ourselves a model of what effective teaching of reading looks like. Okay? Now, we're refining it all the time, we're building it, we're polishing it with others, but we've got a picture in our head of what does it mean to be an effective reader and what does an effective teacher of reading look like and if we don't keep that model in our head we're easily distracted by those wretched wretched scripted reading programs that have nothing to do with the student who's sitting in front of them okay <laughs> it's not a rat <laughs> This is just a statement of subtle opinion. <laughs> you know as professionals how to teach the children. Okay? And you need to be relentless in your pursuit of the teaching and not give them the kids away to something that is glossy and sexy looking and published um, and marketed and perhaps on a computer that gives instant feedback on discrete skills to kids that the computer can't actually recognize. Okay? You're more powerful when you sit side by side with them. Okay, so don't give up on the piece that's about how important you are. It's part of the mental model of reading. Okay? Um, you have a third goal, an, inf an enhanced view, because we all have lots of skill in this area, but enhanced ideas about how to polish getting that one-on-one -on -one support, getting that differentiation, getting that piece in, in both whole group instruction and small group instruction. So what can I do to make what I'm doing even better? How, what can I learn from samples that others are doing to make it even better? 
And of course, I want to be leaving with a question and a plan, because it's always about action, but it's also good about having something to continue to think about, because that's what keeps that um, practice that we're engaged in better and better. We had fabulous results this year. Teachers' work was outstanding, but we've still got some kids that we want to work with to continue to close the gap. And to do that, we need that whole collective energy and wisdom of what we have in this room and beyond. And so we want to keep going with that question about what else could I be doing, could we be doing that would make a greater difference. So here's what this afternoon is going to look like. I'm going to do a review, and as Maureen said, mining deeper into the Allington's Pillars piece. Okay, That's our research foundation. What does this look like? Okay. We're also going to look a little bit more closely at small group reading or guided reading. One of the things we found around the province, and Maureen kept saying to me, I can't believe how many people are doing guided reading. I had no idea it was so popular. I said, it's hugely popular. She said, it is. It is. But it's so different everywhere we go. And I said, it is. And some of the differences <laughs> are more different than others. And so we're just going to look a little bit about what some of that, because again, we don't have time to waste when we're working with our kids. We want to be as effective as possible. And so it's not just about trying hard, but it's trying to make some choices that make a, as big a difference as possible. Then Paige is going to talk a little bit about weaving in assessment for learning. You know she's brilliant at that piece. And Laura is going to layer on her wisdom about embedding Indigenous principles of learning at the end. And I'm going to try and do little tiny bits of that as we go too. So here we go. First thing, remember them. Every child, every day, turn to the person beside you. You have exactly 30 seconds. Can you remember with somebody beside you the six pillars? Go, I'm timing. So we're just going to go through these as a quick dance. And again, what I'm trying to do is present different examples from classes around the province that show where teachers are taking these principles and trying to put them into practice with their kids. Okay. And the piece that I'm hoping that you're thinking about as we go are some of those big ideas that Sharon pulled out. Okay, That piece about... Um, this is based around caring, okay? This is and supportive communities. This is based around how do we get to the individuals within the class. This is based around choice and personalization. This is based around are we doing things that kids would want to do that would help them improve as readers and writers and thinkers. So first one, choice, okay? Now, we have here um, a classroom. This, we've actually got this classroom, and I don't see it. How could this be, Maureen? When you're done, oh, your job is to choose one of the books. Today, you may choose a fly guy book, or you can choose one of the dog books, or I know some of you liked the chapter books we were oh, reading last night. So your job is to choose a book from the pile and <coughs> read, read, read. Because remember, if we want to get to be good readers, we have to do lots of good reading. So when you're done this book, you're going to put it back, and then you keep choosing more and more books you would like to read. Ella? Can we always uh, read? Uh, sure. I'll put spoon. <gasps> Absolutely. All right. Holly? Can you put up these? Yes. You can get the one that you started last time. Absolutely. Get the one that has the bookmark in it. All right. So there you go. Everyone take your spot. Spread out. There we go. Two things. There we go. All right. Okay. So, here's a guided reading group. Okay. Michelle is a teacher librarian and resource teacher at a school in Richmond. This is they finished. They've gone through their book today. They've had their little lesson. This is a group of kids at the end of the year in grade one. This is a group of students that the resource team and the classroom teachers said at spring break, this group is not making the progress that we would like them to make. They are the most at-risk group we have right now. And so they increased the amount of support that they got from spring break until June. Okay? And so one of the things they did is that they started getting small group reading instead of twice a week in the classroom with the classroom teacher and the resource teacher, teacher librarian working in there together four times a week. And two of those times, Michelle took them to the library. Okay? And they had their reading time there. Now, you look at this group of kids, 
And what, you know, what do I notice when I'm there? And Lisa and I were there in June videotaping them. A, that they all wore their good clothes because they knew they were going to be videotaped. <laughs> um, but there were more girls, you'll see them again in other little segments, more girls than boys. Okay? They totally did not look like our little boy this morning. Okay, that's a totally different group of, than the group of kids that do with is representing. But the piece that I want you to really think about in here is that anybody can be a reader at Promise. Okay, and in our school building, we think about who needs the support and how do we support them to become better readers. Now, they have their little guided reading lesson together. Then they do with a common book. And then you can see that they're moving around on the floor. And Michelle reads next with each and every one of them. And as soon as she goes around to make sure she has a little read with everybody. And then as soon as they finished reading their book, they go to the book group of books that they really want to read and they bring them back and they read. Now, here's the piece that really made my heart sing when I was in there. Every one of those kids reads for 30 to 45 minutes when they're in the library, okay? And they don't want to leave. Please, can we stay for recess, okay? I'm still reading my book. And all of those books in that book box, some of them are just right books, some of them are not just right books. They're just right for their hearts. They're just right for their passion. They're not just right for their reading level. Spoon, which you'll see later, was a book that they had happened to read as a read aloud in the classroom. Okay? And so that's where the question came from. Couldn't we have Spoon in there? Because they've connected to it emotionally. Because okay? I'd like to read Spoon again later. And you know the piece, everybody from the beginning of time wants to read a chapter book. It's, you know, that's how you know you're successful, even if it has two words on a page, so long as it says chapter one at the top and chapter two at the next page, that's all it takes. Terry, in your next set of books, all the chapter books. Um, because, but those are, the, those are the markers, right? But if you're not there with your eyes on print doing that reading, doesn't make a difference. And so it's just that subtle change in, in, in the choice piece, right? There's different ways of incorporating choice. That's one of them, okay? Here's another piece. This is just choice in where you're sitting. Like, how simple is this? Grab your book and find a place, okay? On my stomach, on my back, against the wall. This is one of the reasons they keep reading, okay? Now, we don't always have the luxury of all those different places, but I, my question is, does the guided reading group always have to be around a little table um, with everybody tightly behaved, okay? Sometimes, yes. Okay, and sometimes we have to get to that part before we can get to this piece. But just, there's that little, you know, let's think about it. Because where do you like to read? Okay, is it always sitting at a chair at your desk? Or do you sometimes read? I heard somebody say today at my table that they actually were a bit jealous of their daughter, Trisha, because she was reading on the porch, um on a couch, actually when she was supposed to be working, which is a true sign of a good reader. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, there's a piece in there about thinking about, th these are just subtle ways to bring in choice that doesn't have to overflow everything else that's going on. Okay. Every child also needs to read accurately. Yes, 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 you have to have a just right book in your hand. Um, and you have to be doing some reading with it. And remember how much the accuracy is? It's really high, but you have to be reading a whole lot. Okay? Intensity and volume count. And we're going to come that back to that with tied into something else in a moment. We also need to be reading something that you understand. Okay? Every day. That's the piece we keep coming back to. Everybody, every day. It's one of the things I worry about when I see that we're doing such, you know, we're doing lots of work around letters and decoding and all of that is good. But I bet in Carol's kindergarten that everybody gets a book in their hand at some point during the day, whether they know any letters at all. And they talk about those things and they act them out and they dance them and they turn them upside down because those are the initial steps into reading. Okay, so, so it's like, let's not forget about those pieces. Most of the time, two-thirds of the time, is spent on reading and rereading. And even when we pull in our systematic decoding and function and, and, and looking at phonics and phonemic awareness and letter sound relationships and letters and, and knowing all those things, we do it. The more we can do it embedded into why would we use this and how does it all work together, the easier it is for those kids who often struggle with transferring a skill to a new situation to do that transfer piece. 
as we come in. So let's just sort of look a little bit about what that can, oh, we won't get to look about that for a minute. Because I just have to put this one up. I don't know why this one got in. It may come up again. No, I heard that come up at some point, you know. No fun, grade one. Really? Like, oh my gosh. It might get worse as you go through school, but why is it not fabulous in grade one? What, but, but I know, here's a piece. It, there's not one teacher in this province that walks in thinking, there will be no fun in my grade one classroom today, okay? Because we have stuff to do, okay? But if the feeling that they have is that they have to get stuff done, that this is the important year, that you might play in kindergarten and you might get a choice in books and you might get some fun things to do in two and three, but in grade one I have to make sure you're ready, um, we're giving the wrong message to people. Okay? Because if you think back to primary program, you know, like it's not all that far away and it actually should still be alive and breathing in our classrooms, yes. young children <laughs> develop differently. Our goal is to have them able to read the text that they come up with as they go through the years, not to have everything done by the end of grade one. So we've all taught kids that took longer in grade one and sometimes grade two and grade three blossomed. Okay? There's not, it's, we worked really hard in primary program not to have those markers come down too quickly and in too tight a way. And so we need to keep remembering that. Um, some of them, you know, some of those kids, the gap closed in that first year. That's remarkable because everybody knows that if you're struggling and this is really hard for you to do and somebody else is not struggling, they're going to make faster progress than you are. That's just kind of a given because you're not working in that same way as they are. But given enough time, if we look at this as a two or three year plan, What's going to happen to those kids? So I'm thinking about these kids that we tracked so carefully this year. And my question to those of you in the districts is, what are you doing? Actually, this is Kathy Champion's question. And then she said it when Maureen was doing a session last week. And I thought, very, very smart question. Um, what are we doing to keep track of those kids next year in our districts? Because I bet some of those kids, if we keep up that relentless pursuit of achievement with them, achievement and joy with them, we're going to see more kids who are closer to where we'd like them to be. Because it takes longer for some of us when we first get started. All of us have things that it's taken us longer to get started on than somebody else. And so it's not just a one-year piece. We've got, we'll have a new group this year. But, you know, in our districts, uh, for the district people who are there, how are we watching those kids to see if over time we're making a difference? Because we need to take that pressure off grade one teachers of getting it all done. They need to know their letters, they need to know their sounds, they need to be able to do this, they need to do that. They need to be see themselves as readers. They need to want to stay with the pursuit of continuing to be a reader. They want to stay with the pursuit of not learning to read and that being different from reading to learn. They want to be reading to learn right from the beginning. And that takes all of us, whether we're in grade one or two or three or support or admin or wherever that comes, to that united piece that says together we're working to say how do we instill the fun into grade one to reinstill the fun. And, and it's not everywhere, but it came up a lot. It came up a lot, and I think it's because we're, there's a lot of us working really, really hard, and we're working so really, really hard to get all the stuff that we think needs to be done that we've forgotten in our attempts to do that, that the joy would make the engagement higher. So, but it's not a single person thing. That's a community and a school that works on that. So, I know all you may, some of you might be able to read this. I didn't actually mean to leave this in as a slide, but um, it's easier to use uh, the teacher's words. She didn't leave her name. It's a grade one, two teacher in one of her letters um, who was talking about um, how do you find time to give the one-on-one -on -one support um, to look at some choice to get that engagement and joy. So the synopsis of this piece, because you can multitask while it's up there, is that the child that she'd identified was in a program at the local library where they had a therapy dog and for six weeks in the library program, the child read to the dog, okay? Loved it. Came home, came back to school, talked about it, a lot of enthusiasm. She couldn't bring it, she didn't have a therapy dog to bring into the school, but she thought, so what could we do that would be similar? 
and she got a fish. Okay? Now fish, even I can have a fish pet. So, you know, that's, that's something that you can handle. She got the fish, and not only did the little girl reach the fish, other kids read to the fish. And it became one of the choices of what you could do. You could go with your partner and you could read to the fish. And they practiced so they could read to the fish. They reread to the fish. And the feedback you get from the fish is not a lot of overcorrection. So <laughs> it's a good audience. Okay. Okay. Now, so this child was just, you know, it's that how do you, how do you get those opportunities? Now is that not joyful? Okay. And it's not high maintenance. Okay. Um, in most cases, um, but to have that fish in there. And of course what that then did was that because the fish was there, it sparked writing. Okay, So it becomes that circle again of how you build in those pieces as you're going through. So this is a piece, you can have this about the accuracy. You can take your just right books, you can read your just right books. You could have this about something that you're really excited about. You could read the books that might not be just right but you're excited and tell the fish what it is you've been learning. And you can take a partner there but you've got all those opportunities that become highly encouraging to come in and pull them as we go through. Okay, every child every day writes about something personally meaningful. It is not about the, what did you do on your summer holidays? It's not personally meaningful. Those stories are really good when you tell somebody eye to eye and face to face and you get to wave your hands and talk about it. But, uh, you know, I bet most of us have not journaled all summer about the events of our day or waited until Labor Day so that we could have a reflective write <laughs> on how our summer was. Okay? It's just, it's not the engaging piece. You know? Sharon kept reminding us, engagement, engagement. But I also believe that we can convince kids that they want to be engaged in almost anything. Okay? So you, it's the piece of saying, how do you do something in the classroom that's engaging enough that they want to participate and writing is just so simple. So. Here's just a tiny, tiny example. So this is in De Putter's room. Miracle Beach? Devon. 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 Okay, this is Devon De, De Putter, and she's in grade three in Miracle Beach. So here's what the lesson looked like. I'm, the teacher has said, my kids are, are loving to write. They're, they're getting really good at writing. They're good at building criteria, but I'd really like to work on building some depth um, and description into the writing. And so we're in there doing one of those demo classes. Here's a simple, simple lesson. I start and I write in front of them. Okay? And I say to them, here's my writing. Your job is, and it's a really quick write, and I'm doing it just as I'm, you know, it's sort of spilling out of my head, and I'm hoping it's going to be a good example that day, because huh? there's a lot of people watching. But it's, you know, something that you can do really easily. And I'm, I'm talking to them about what's going on and the thinking in my head. And I'm saying things like, oh, I hope this is going to be interesting because I'm really concerned about my audience because if you think it's boring, you're not going to want to read my writing and so that's not so good. And so I'm, I'm, it's a setup, right? Because I'm modeling for them what I'd like them to do. So I've said, hooray, it's sunny. I hate running in the rain. My toes get cold and squishy. Um, oh, and wet and squishy when it's raining. I hope I run as fast as my friend Lester because I don't like being pokey and slow. Okay? So I'm talking about this as I write. Um, and we're talking about, you know, have you ever been doing something that you know you really kind of like to do, but then there's parts of it that you're not so sure about because of what's going on? And what do you notice about my writing? Because they're going to give me some feedback. And so they say that they think I talked about emotion and had some feeling, that I did some detail and that I painted a picture, which I thought was most generous of them. Um, but I was willing to accept any praise that they gave. And I'd been, you know, as I've been saying, I'm saying, I'm trying to make sure you can see what I'm doing so that you know, they can sort of get that little hint as we're going. And then we all thought of something active that we liked to do that we could tell a story about that had some challenge or push or excitement to it. And then we sat very simply in partners Here's what it looks like. I sit next to Malia, and I, t and this is timed, I have one minute to tell her my story. And she listens silently, okay? Being a very supportive audience, mm -hmm. but not saying a word for a whole minute, and I'm timing them, okay? And then she has 30 seconds to give me some feedback, ask me some questions, see what, you know, 
what, what about this? I really like that idea. And then she has a minute to tell her story, and I have 30 seconds to give her feedback. And then you have a little walk around the room just to get your thinking going, and then you get to come back and you tell the story that you'd like to tell in writing. Okay? As simple as that. Works all the time. Okay? Usually you model what that conversation is going to look like so that the kids can get a sense of what the behavior is like in there, but twos and threes, no problem. Now, this whole thing is about, was about an hour in full length. Four or five of the kids had computers or iPads because for them to get, and as Alan said, twos or threes, right? For them to get their ideas down quickly and easily was hard to do it with a pen and pencil, okay? But not so hard with a computer or an iPad. Now, nobody paid any attention to the fact with whether you were working on paper or whether you were working on a computer. There was no fuss about that. It was just who's doing what as they go forward, okay? So here's one of the ones that came through. Um, look at the difference. Think about what that child would be doing if they were struggling with a pencil and a piece of paper, okay, in terms of engagement. And look at the thinking that comes out. Okay? Snap went my bindings as I clicked my feet into my bindings. As I pushed like I was ice skating, I maneuvered my ways over to the easiest hill. Pushing off the hill, it felt like I was going so fast. Like, much better content than the model had been. Right? Much better content. Okay? okay, And this is one of the kids who's needing some extra support in the writing. Now, same piece in this one, but here's the piece that I want you to notice. Because it's that, how do you put out the choices of what kids are going to do? And this ties to Deb's comments about assessment. So we talked about, remember, here's the things you're going to try and do, emotion and feeling, paint a picture. Um, whatever the third one is that I can't remember, maybe details. Um, when you're finished, would you find the sentence that you think is the most powerful? Okay. It's a standard job. What's the sentence or the phrase that you think is the most powerful? And mark it up. Okay. So that you can find it when it comes time to share. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what the spelling is. I don't actually care now about your sound symbol. I want to know what you care about in terms of meaning in your writing. Okay. And everybody needs to have one. Something that you really care about. And then is there something else in there that you'd like us to notice that you think you did a really good job on that was tied to our criteria? So there's jobs to do when you're finished that keep those goals in mind that allow everybody to participate and come in. Now, that doesn't take me a long time to plan for, but if it becomes routine, then the kids are doing it all the time. And they're saying to each other as they go, I've really done a good job in descriptive words. Way better than she did, right? Really good on descriptive words. And look at the ones. Because those goals are in their heads. Okay? So it's taking it back to oral language. It's taking it back to the, what do the shared values for what we're doing look like in here? And how do we keep this so all can participate? Every child talks with peers about reading and writing. Now, a couple of examples of what this can look like. One is, now this is Tori from that little reading group. Remember the thing about, can you put in spoon? Tori was the one who went, oh, because she wasn't the one who'd suggested putting in spoon, and she thought she wasn't going to get spoon, um, because Ella had suggested it, and Ella got it first. Because this is a piece, now again, we can think of this as play-based, we can think about this as community building, we can think about this as being socially responsible, but it's wanting to do what others are doing in your group in the classroom. Okay? Listen to Tori when she talks about why she chose this book. Hi Tori, I was wondering if I could ask you a question today. Sure, what is it? I would like to know, um, why did you choose the book Spoon to read? That's because a girl named Ella, I asked to have it and she said yes. And I like this spoon so much. That's because Mrs. Akita introduced this spoon to my classroom. And after Ella read it, I asked if I could have it. And this is how I got Spoon. And the favorite part of of Spoon for me is when he wants to spoon with his mom and dad. Now remember, Tori's here not because she's one of the most skilled readers in the class. I, she's in this little group because she's one of the kids they were worried about. 
Okay, she's one of the kids that wasn't making the progress that they expected, um, and they were trying to make sure that everybody was reading by the end of the year. Great oral language, right? Great oral language, and she's going to organize the world when she gets through, um, as she you know fixes her hair. And well, my friend Ella, um, but but she wasn't connecting with print, okay? Because different kids come in in different ways, okay? And so. Is this a book that's actually just right for her? Absolutely not. But she's going to read it and reread it and get better and better and better because she likes the part about spooning with her parents. And that connects in the book. Okay? That's, that's the piece in there that we come back about. So talking about your reading and writing sometimes can be talking about feedback that we're giving to each other um, as we're looking at the writing, you know, share who, what sentence did you underline, those kinds of pieces. But it's also a piece that's that natural piece in the classroom. Is there time for kids to talk about what they're choosing to read and to tell others? Because if somebody likes a book, it flies, especially somebody with status, it flies through the classroom, right? And this started because the teacher introduced the book. And then somebody else wanted the book, and then somebody else wanted the book. Okay, that's a piece of sharing. Okay. Here's another piece. This is Helena, and I don't know how to say her last name, Takar. This is from one of the um, Saanich case studies. And she has a little piece in here that she calls, what well, you can see them as they go. It's the li link, listen, and learn. Okay. So the kids have reading goals, so they're talking about their goals, they've got their goal entry their goal behavior. They have a one or two minute popcorn party where they wander around the classroom and they talk to others about what their goal is that they're working on today. Okay. Now, who do you know that wouldn't want to participate in a popcorn party? Okay. Names make a big difference. But they're talking about a goal. So they wander around and they talk to at least three people, which helps them solidify the goal. right? So that they really know what it is they're doing. And then they do the triple L. Link, listen, and learn. And they find a partner, they link up with their partner, they find a place to quietly read to each other, with, and this time they're working with their just right books, okay, because it's important to do that every day. And when they're together, they tell their goal, their partner's job is to listen to their goal and to give them some advice about how well they're doing on their goal, so they can both learn together, and then they switch roles, and on they go. Now, isn't that seamless and isn't that brilliant. Okay? From, a pop, from a goal to a popcorn party to a triple L. Okay? And you know, she says like, as she continues with her writing, she said it took a while to learn all these pieces, but now that it's there, it's a structure in the classroom that just keeps on going. Okay. Um, and the last one, everybody listens to a fluent adult read aloud every day, different kinds of texts with some kind of commentary. So a fluent adult doesn't necessarily always mean I start at the beginning and I read without interruption through to the end. Okay? In fact, I have a very hard time doing that at all. Um, though I do, you know, it's one of my goals that I can do that at some point in time. So I just want to model a couple of ways to do that with different kinds of texts. So again, it's the piece that if we're thinking about joy in the classroom and taking these pieces back and building the expertise in our practice without drowning in the prep that we think about accessible ways in. Okay. So I'm going to start, but actually I think you have to say something first because you're looking a bit droopy. Say something to the person beside you. Okay, what's on your mind? There's another piece, and I'm not going to have time to talk about this one a lot, but there's a piece in here, and I'm going to give you this as a hook. Um, one of the other books that's in the series that I, I just thought was gorgeous is called We Greet the Four Seasons. And one of the reasons I liked the book was the language in it was exquisite. And so when I was reading this book with the kids, I'd be talking about the choice of language that Terry used when she put together the book. Okay? There are four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, in each of the four directions of the medicine wheel. Okay? Each season is greatly respected for all the gifts that are offered. Who thought of respecting a season? That's different than what I'd thought about before. Now, this is what I'm saying to the kids. I think about, oh, it's fall or it's autumn. The leaves are going to change. It's going to get wetter in Vancouver. Um, but this is talking about respect for a season. That's different, isn't it? 
Now I wonder what it is they're respecting. I wonder if we move on, if we can find out why it is it's about respect and what we'd find out about in here. And what are the gifts that a season brings? That's a change in my thinking. I hadn't thought about that piece. Now, Terry said, oh, there's a brilliant way. She didn't say brilliant. It is brilliant. Way to use this medicine wheel to start a class. Okay. She'll tell you about it if you go by. Okay. Um, because you've got to keep moving forward. Okay, here is one of the things that is a goal. No matter the age of the kids, we need their eyes on print 30 minutes a day, minimum. Okay. Not just reading to me, not just reading to the dog, not just reading to the fish, not just reading to um, a, another teacher, the resource teacher in the room, out of the room. We have many, many kids who won't do this reading when they're at home. They need 30 minutes of reading with their eyes on print while they're with us at school. So how are we organizing for that? Okay. Throughout the day. Okay. In some cases, it might be all at the same time. In other cases, it's going to be spread throughout the day. Okay. But how do we organize to make sure that there's time, time, time for them to get together and have eyes on print? Okay. So here's an example of, this is one of the books that's a follow-up at the same level as Bad Luck Duck. So if I've been doing some work with Bad Luck Duck, and I've been doing some um, phonemic awareness with it, and I've been doing some sound symbol and talking about letters and trying to sort of pull that across the room with the group of kids that I've got, I'm also going to take, one of the things I might do is take the other books that are about the same level, introduce them a bit to the kids, and leave them there for choices for kids to read. Okay? So here's an example. I just have to show you this one because I just want to see if you make a connection to anybody in the room when you look at this. Uh, look at the web. Okay. So I'm actually thinking of the, the lovely lipstick and the bright hair on the left hand side and I'm not going to give any hints about who I think it might be but um, there's you see these these leveled books come and they have fiction and they have non-fiction. And what would happen if after we'd done, and this could even be in a guided reading group, if after we had done our whole group or our small group piece, if we said to the kids, you can read a fiction book, here's an example, or you could read a non-fiction. It's controlled choice. It's only two books instead of one as your follow-up. And would that make a difference as to who grabbed a book? Okay. And would some always go to the fiction and some always go to the non-fiction? Because choice, you know, we can do that. You know, they're, they're similar enough. They've been made, they've been controlled, written, so that there's, you know, not going to be in, inordinately difficult compared to the way you've been introducing them. But that would be a simple choice, and it wouldn't take, again, forever to prepare at night, so you had lots of energy to work with the kids and to come in. Now, just, again, you see, they've got hints down the side, so if I'm new, it gives me some ideas of what I could do. Here's how I could do it the first time. Because those of us who've been doing this for a while, some of it's just intrinsic. You think, oh, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. And some of those new teachers who are 24 and 25 years old are thinking, how do they know that? Um, how did you ever figure that out? Because they haven't gained the experience yet. We learn a lot from our experiences. Now, just again, so you get a sense of what it is, the spider's in the kitchen. And again, you can have all that conversation around it. And the pictures are great. Um, look at the web. Now, you need to know that Maureen is very, very neat. So this is certainly something that she could be doing. And it goes on and on and on as it goes through until it comes to near the end. And it has the patterns. It's all about the spider. And there's a look at the, look at the, here's the spider. And he's in three different rooms. And then look at, so you're getting the repetition. You're getting the pattern. But you've got rich fun pictures that you can yak about a lot, which takes you back into the book. And then the spider goes on, and it does just a little bit more. Now, again, we come back and we think about, so during the day, what are all the things that we're trying to do with our kids, okay, to give those opportunities. We want to have read aloud. Now, it says read aloud once. You probably want to have read aloud two, three, four times during the day. Let me just read you this little bit and leave it as an invitation. Let me just read you this little bit and leave it as an invitation. It doesn't always have to be the whole book. Okay? You're thinking aloud and you're doing shared reading okay? because that invites the kids in and their voices to participate in making meaning. What does this piece look like? You think about what's the individual practice going to happen to be. If you don't get the individual practice, you can't go from being in being having an independent practice to making an independent choice that actually works for you. 
that you need all those pieces each day. You need some writing every day where you're getting some feedback about what it is you're doing. Sometimes the writing is shared writing and sometimes it's independent writing. Okay? But throughout the day, when you're looking at your day plan, you look at those plans and how those pieces come together. One of the things I worry about is in our zest to have small group reading if we've forgotten about any other aspects of teaching reading throughout the day. That all of our energy is going into the small group and we're not doing that whole group piece. We're not having that whole rich conversation that's helping kids move from being strategic learning strategies to becoming strategic readers. That it keeps them involved in the conversation of what all those big pieces look like as they go through. Um, and we're looking and we're getting, there's a danger in becoming too tight in what we're doing um, and not making sure there's enough choice in there for kids. Okay, it's that same thing of everybody fitting into the same, same piece. You may have seen, because we've, they've been around for a while, I think in sort of 94, 95, we made a series of primary literacy videos that are stored on the Campbell River website. Um, I did three on writing strategies, squiggles, it's all in the bag, and something else, um, which must have been, oh, clustering from text. There is one on talking tables from, and that was if you, that first, to the best of my knowledge, first started bubbling up in, in Rupert is where I first heard about it. So there's a lovely one on talking tables. There's one on At Promise, and Marnie McMahon did a lovely, lovely um, one on teaching a guided reading lesson. And at that time, um, in Campbell River, they taught the formula for doing this lesson, the pattern for doing this lesson, to all the grade one teachers, all the grade two teachers, all the support teachers, and all the administrators. So that everybody knew how to follow a pat this particular pattern in the lesson. And then they could go away and work with it. But they had a common pattern so that all the aspects of reading that they were trying to work on as a district came through. So if you go to the website, um, and sometimes it works seamlessly and sometimes it doesn't, but you're probably smarter at that than I am, um, that is well, well worth watching, Marnie's um, video. Now, that's a piece that shows a very structured, organized, tight um, intervention, or intervention's probably the wrong word, guided reading group. The kids have all been benchmarked. They're in discrete levels. They have exquisite book rooms um, when you look at the video. The important piece is, they, in my mind, is that they met as a team and said, what are the parts that we want to cover? And then they made sure that everybody knew how to do the lesson so that it was common practice, okay? And they covered them as they went through. Their lesson pattern, this is all up there, um, went through from rereading known text, high frequency writing, introduce a new book, picture walk, reading the text, responding to the text, skills in context, interactive writing. Okay? So if you were anywhere in there, that, that's what the formula for the lesson looked like, no matter who was teaching it. Okay? And you see what that looks like, and notice how tightly the timing is. Okay? It's tight, it's organized, and that, I'm, that's one example of what guided reading, small group reading can look like. Okay, so, and that's the way you can access it. Now, there's, if we swing to sort of the opposite to that, sort of along the pendulum, because one of the pieces I want you to think about is, there's not just one right way to do guided reading either, right? This is right at one way, it's a very smart way, and it's a very good match for some of us, okay? And the little clip I'm going to show you, or the little bit I'm going to talk about about Michelle, is another way, it's a very smart way, and it's not a very smart way for all of us. And all of us need to figure out where are we between this way and this way, and how does it match for our kids, without feeling guilty about where we are along the continuum, because it's not a right or a wrong, and it's not a from and a to. But they're different choices, and that choice piece is important. So, uh, I'm going to skip that part. So, Michelle is teacher librarian and resource teacher, okay? She's new in her school this year, this past year. She met with the grade one teachers, and the two grade one teachers said, yeah, I think maybe we could do this guided reading. It's brand new to us, okay? There's, we don't have a big fancy book room, and, and this is new to us. What will it look like? She said, well, it's probably best twice a week, uh, but the first thing we need to do is we need to set up um, literacy stations because the kids need to know how to work in the literacy stations. So they can be in literacy stations while others are in guided reading groups. And so they, they can do, you can do literacy stations when I'm not here. 
because I won't be here all the time. And here's the trick about our literacy stations. Every one of them is really going to just be reading. Okay? They're going to have a beach literacy station where the kids put on sunglasses and lay on their um, blankets and their beach blankets and that's one literacy station. Um, you know, there's a literacy station where you can listen to a book on tape. There's a literacy station where you can read with a buddy um, on a different kind of matter inside the hula hoop. Um, but the literacy stations are really just all different forms of getting together and reading. But they all seem different, right? Sunglasses are, you know, that makes a big difference. What, so we teach the kids that first. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the books we've got and we're going to put them in piles. Hard, harder, hardest. Okay? And when we've got three piles of the books, then we're going to take each pile and we're going to divide it into two. Hard and harder. And we say to the kids we're doing it with hard, harder, and hardest because they know that they want to read the hard books. So you don't want to say these are the easy books because nobody wants to go to easy books. These are the hard books, these are the harder books, these are the hardest books, and then you divide them within that. And then that's how, and so that's what the leveling looked like. Now that's quite different than benchmarks, right? And again, it's not that this is right and this is wrong, but somewhere along there you need to find your fit for yourself. Okay. Now, they came twice a week, they all worked together in the classroom as much as they could. Sometimes one of them would take the noisiest group into the hall. Okay. But not, it wasn't that as the resource teacher you're out in the hall, okay, or as the classroom teacher you're out in the hall, sometimes if the activity you're going to be doing, you could leave the classroom. Okay. But it was co-planned together. Like that's the piece that's important as they were going. And then when they met as a resource team, because resource teams do this, they said at spring break, there is that one, in the one class, there's a group of kids who are not making, the, they're not going to be readers by the end of the year. Okay. So let's figure out what we can do. So they changed the support. Okay? And bumped it up to four. And she just did that one that one group of kids got two extra guided reading times every week. So that by the end of the year, they were all reading. All reading within expectations. Okay, as they were going through. Now, here's what their piece looked like. Word work, then a little bit of work with sight words. Then lots of talk about what are the strategies that good readers do. So they could look for evidence of those when they were working on them. Picture walk, read alone, read with the teacher, choose another book to read. Aiming always at, during that time, eyes on print for 30 minutes. Okay? Eyes on print for 30 minutes as they went through. So again, you see those same parallel pieces, but some changes coming back and forth as they go. Is that making some sense? Okay, you're thinking about where you are in the continuum. Can you imagine having a reading group when you hadn't benchmarked your kids? Okay. Can you imagine having a reading group and benchmarking your kids? Okay. Those are sort of the two biggest differences that I see as I'm going around the province is that some, in some places we can't imagine starting until everybody's had a benchmark level. And in other places, people are saying, what is it benchmarks that everybody's talking about? I'm doing the small groups, but I don't know what it is. Okay. So you, you need to figure out the part along there about what's making the difference to get those kids to the place you want them to be. Joy, engagement, invitation, can-do, growth mindset. Okay. Now, here is the last little piece that I want you to just have a chance to reflect on at the end. So this is just a little snippet of the three teachers at the end of the year thinking about what's happened and how the collaboration worked. Because tomorrow, Randy and I are going to do some work around collaboration, but the piece that we keep coming back to and thinking about is, it's all that, you know, it's who helps you. I believe that everybody who is still excited about teaching um, later, after they've been teaching for a while, is still excited about teaching because they talk to somebody else about their teaching. And that if you've got nobody to talk to, then it's harder to stay excited. And so it's that piece about how does that working together make a difference. Now, Mich I was lucky to work with Michelle several years you ago. You know how to read, right? I would say the key for us, too, is just having those small groups and you knew you were doing a lesson at their level, mm -hmm. which is so, that's never been in my practice before. I've never been able to have kids learning at their level. I'm doing a lesson just for those kids because I know that's what they need. Those kids don't need it, so they're not in that group kind of thing, mm -hmm. which I've never had that experience before. So, I mean, to have that, to have that is just... 
totally opens up your world. So, and really, what you do tomorrow is based on what they did today. Yeah, exactly. So it's saying, okay, this is what they did well, and this is what I need to work and on. And you also like, time. I was worried at the beginning that I was going to have to do so much planning. I was worried, okay, I don't know. Like usually, it's like I'm following a, a reading, like a program, and I have to teach this lesson. This is all there for me. But with this, I, I knew I had to make up some more of my own things. But it, it just came. It just flew. It just flew, well, it was very fluid. Like I knew what I was going to do tomorrow because I know what we did yesterday. And I know I could do this because it was only like little 25 minute groups you had them for. So it was easy to sort of come up with what you wanted to do next because you only had. And piggybacking on that, it was so easy to follow their interests as well. Yeah. Like the little group was like so interested in like Amelia Bedelia. And then you like, could do that. Yeah. yeah. And then you had that flexibility where just doing one book for the whole group or, you know, mm -hmm. so I think that was intimidating for me at the beginning. I said, I'm going to have to plan it for all these different things, but it didn't turn out that way at all. Very surprising. Little lessons come out of just little tiny things. Whiteboards and pens and just them exploring a little bit. So, Can you make your comment again, Michelle, about the literacy, about taking the clips at the beginning? So you should have had video clips oh, in the yeah, beginning because we, we did have vulnerable re yes. readers. Yes, yeah. and I think the important thing is I wish we did video take yeah. these kids at the beginning because we did have vulnerable readers. We had kids that had the red sticker on that we knew we were going to have to focus in. And at the end of the year, they all can read. And I think it's it's really a result of yeah. in direct instruction in reading. And and, uh, and I think, yeah, kudos to you. <laughs> it's confidence in themselves, mm -hmm. yeah. too. So. Mm -hmm. And all of them see themselves as readers and read yeah. confidently and pick up a book. And if you ask them, are you a good reader? Every single one of them would say yes. I'm yeah, a and they're not afraid to say that's not at my level. Yeah, like yeah. I always say, is, is this a, even when we're doing the iPads? Is this is this website at your level? Nope. Okay, well let's not use that one then. Like they're all they know finding good books that fit yeah they know their level, which is kind of neat. And so the last thing I want you to leave with, um, as we I turn this over to Paige, is. The first and most important piece, trust your professional expertise. Okay? You know a tremendous amount, and the people in your building know an even more tremendous amount when you put all of your collective wisdom together and continue to ask questions about what it is you're doing. So when you head out today, keep thinking about what's my mental model of reading? What do other people think about in here? What do I know how to do? And don't give away your most vulnerable kids to somebody else's program. Right? Think about what you need to know and how capable you are and how important that caring piece was. Remember how the caring comes out? It's hard to get bonded with a computer um, or even an iPad. Stick with the piece about how do you keep building on the piece of what you know and how important that piece is. Your most important piece is following the lead of your children. Yeah? Uh, Rowena said, they liked Amelia Bedelia, so we did Amelia Bedelia. Okay? It might not have been a perfect match in the level, but if that's what the group wants, they'll read Amelia Bedelia way faster than they'll read something else about bears if they're not into a bear mood just now. And if, if this is in that piece around, especially around the small groups, give them some latitude, Let, build in that piece that, that goes not just with the skills, but goes on the interest and the motivation. And the most, most, most important piece that you want, this will be my major yearly rant, no program exists that can replace you. Not any program. There is not a shred of evidence in any program that passes the, uh, the What Works Clearinghouse that's an outside program that has evidence that says this is better than what a classroom teacher would have done with this child. Okay. So there may be bits and pieces of things that you pull in, um, but the piece that's the most important by far in the classroom is you, the relationship with the kids, and the decisions you make based on the needs that they bring in. So we saw spectacular results this year. We will see even more spectacular results next year. Mm -hmm.